I'm Eleanor Sayer, and I'm going to talk about assessing thinking like a physicist. So we have a big question here. How do we make more scientists? Because there's a national shortage, don't you know? But because I'm a physicist, what I really care about is how do we make more physicists? And if the thing we're going to worry about is how do we make more physicists, then really we have to worry about how do people become physicists? And one view of becoming a physicist is that you learn a lot of physics content knowledge, and these are the most popular books in undergraduate physics. And this says that learning physics is a technical endeavor. But another view of becoming a physicist is to grow to participate in a professional community of practice. And this says that becoming a physicist is about identity and it's about enculturation. And Obviously, we need both of these views to get a really full picture of how people become physicists. So well, now we have a new problem. What evidence do we have for how people become physicists? And here I'm going to look for observational cues for thinking like a physicist, because a necessary prerequisite to becoming a physicist is to think like a physicist. So let's look for some constraints. Thinking like a physicist, these markers should reflect both the technical and the social aspects. They should generalize well across physics content and courses and problems. And we want to see this spot in vivo. We want to see it in our physics classrooms and when our students are doing their homework and when they are talking to us. We don't just want to see it when they come to our research lab to do interviews. And Personally, my research is on upper-level physics courses, so I want to see it in the kinds of courses that I take data. And we're going to do this by listening to students talk about physics. So let's look at a quick example. This is Julie. Um, Julie is in classical mechanics. She's a, a sophomore or a junior at this point, and she's uh, coming to this homework help session to work on her homework problems with the TA and some other students. And she says, talking about the professor and something that happened in class, the professor says, blows up. And I was thinking, when I think blow up, I think like, you know, <laughs> it's funny to be like, what the heck? And then ask him, he's like, oh, I mean this. And I'm like, oh, okay. And the TA, and the TA is ordinarily a very kind-hearted, PER-aware kind of person, says, pretty much everyone in physics uses blows up to mean the exponential gets really big. And Julie says, well, I don't know enough physics, apparently. Oh, that's really sad. Let's look at uh, the, the aspects of this little bit of Julie's speech. She's linking the technical and social, social aspects of what it means to know physics. She's making a generalized assessment of her knowledge in physics. She's not just talking about solving linear first order differential equations. She makes the statement in vivo. Nobody asked her to make it, and she doesn't... Um, uh, she's not doing it as part of a reflection, a generalized reflection of what's going on. Altogether, her speech is brief, it's embedded in a larger context, it's spontaneous, and it's metacognitive. So this kind of brief, embedded, spontaneous, metacognitive talk is what we're going to look at in a lot more detail. And because saying brief, embedded, spontaneous, metacognitive takes a lot of time, I'm just going to call it Bessem. So let's look at a longer Besson talk example. This comes from an oral exam in the second month of mechanics. There are two participants in this exam, the student, Zeke, who's a fantastic student, and the examiner. And the examiner doesn't say very much. Um, Zeke's working on a much longer problem, which has as an early component looking at the signs of forces from a box on two springs. So if you had a box on two springs and you moved it over to the side like this, the compressed spring would push it over at minus kx, and the extended spring would pull it over at minus kx, and you would add those together and get minus 2kx. And Zeke's really going to spend a lot of time worrying about why is it minus and why is it 2. And by a lot of time, I mean about 5 minutes. So how he does this is he does this very great chain of reasoning. He starts with a simpler situation, a single spring. He breaks it into the cases of extension and compression. He comes up with F equal to minus Kx. He says, if the mass goes to the right, then we have a plus X displacement. Minus Kx is negative. The force points to the left. That makes sense. Then he goes and adds into the second spring, and he checks for consistency with the first case on both the left and the right. He says, 
We've got a positive x, the equation for the second spring is negative, and the force points that way. Makes sense. Then he turns around and says to the examiner, okay, I'm happy now. And the import of him saying, I'm happy now, is to say that all of, I'm, I'm done thinking about this. I am ready to present my ideas to you. So in this, this short little clip, we've got three examples of Besom talk. Let's look at the regions around it to see how Zeke is or is not thinking like a physicist. We notice that there's so these Besom talk examples are surrounded by this technical content in which Zeke is coordinating multiple representations, using an implicit coordinate system, using lots of socially determined physics conventions. So already we're seeing both the technical and the social sides of thinking like a physicist. He's got an expectation of consistency here between these multiple representations that in a, in a sense, it shouldn't matter which representation you use to describe the physical world, they should all give you to the same place. And as a bonus, we're learning about Zeke's autonomy as a solver. When he says, okay, I'm happy now, he's saying, I solved this for me. I didn't need you to approve the way I solved it. Now I'm gonna turn around and um, present to you what I have just figured out. Autonomy as a solver is really important because it's about becoming an expert anything, not just becoming an expert physicist. So, altogether then, Besom Talk tells us about how students are learning physics content, it tells us about how they are becoming a physicist, and it tells us about how they are becoming expert problem solvers. All of this is great, and it gives us the observational cues for thinking like a physicist that we were looking for when we initially posed this problem. So now we have a new problem. How can we promote people thinking like physicists? Because if we want more of them, then we have to promote uh, this kind of thinking. Well, we can't really promote it until we know how to assess it in our physics classes. And we can do that the same way, by listening to students doing physics. And one way that I do that is with oral exams. I love oral exams. Oral exams are like a lab practical for lecture classes. They're a guided conversation with a physicist about physics. You can give much more complicated questions than in a written exam, and you get much richer responses. So they give us this great lens into how students are doing sense-making and becoming physicists as embedded in our courses. And they're a little different than uh, written exams because there's this emphasis on sense-making, not manipulation. You can uh, stop a calculation before it takes up a lot of time. You can fix small mistakes before they snowball, and you can notice when they're actually small. You also have the freedom to explore topics that students bring up. So this uh, long conversation that Zeke had about the signs of forces was something that he brought up. It also means that they're great for diverse classes where you have some students who are really on top of things and other students who are really kind of struggling with the material. As an instructor, I worry a lot about my time in a in an, in, while I'm teaching and while I'm giving exams, and it turns out that orals are time cheaper than written exams if you have less than 12 students. So for small enrollment classes like we often have in our upper, upper division classes, orals are actually less time for you, the instructor, and you get a better, more honest assessment of what your students are doing. Isn't that awesome? So let's put it all together. We're looking for observational cues for measuring thinking like a physicist. And we have this brief, embedded, spontaneous metacognitive talk, which reveals student expectations about the nature of physics, and as a bonus, might indicate their autonomy as problem solvers. It happens in authentic learning situations, like oral exams, when students are doing their homework, or perhaps during tutorials. And we find it by listening to students doing physics. Thanks for your time.